Hello there and a very warm welcome to another edition of Channels Beam. I'm Victor Mathias. Now, insecurity has become a hydra-headed monster which security agents in Nigeria appear to have been fighting hard to end. Yet, incidents such as bombing, kidnapping or hostage-taking, destruction of property, creation of fear and brutal killing of innocent Nigerians, just to mention but a few, keep occurring. Now, the question, however, is for how long? When will all these end and what can be done. Today on the program, we will find answers to these questions. But before we get to that, let's see what is making the trends list in Nigeria's social cyberspace. A multi-year effort aimed at preventing and eliminating violence against women and girls around the world again took center stage as the day set aside to create awareness on the elimination of violence against women. Civil society groups, women's organizations, young people around the world joined forces with the aim to address the global pandemic of violence against women and girls. Worried by the level of insecurity in the country, Nigerians home and abroad trended the hashtag calling for the ouster of service chiefs. Though some capped at the calls, those calling it say Nigeria's security architecture needs a new look. Well, there you go. Those were the trends in the past week, but you can be a part of the conversation from wherever you're watching around the world. Just tweet at us at Channels TV, at Channels Beam, at Victor underscore MBIDI. You can use the hashtag as well, Channels Beam, and also Insecurity. Well, let's get started. We have joining us to look at today's topic, Kabir Baba. He is a lecturer at the Federal University Gashua in Yobe State, and he is a security analyst from Nasarawa State. He joins us from our Abuja studio. Uh, Kabir, it's a pleasure to have you on the program today. Thanks for having me. Indeed, you're welcome. We also have Musa Gambo. He is a humanitarian and a seasoned professional capacity development expert and community mobilizer and is, a, and is currently a program associate with the Center for Advocacy, Transparency and Accountability Initiatives, CATAI in Meduguri, uh, Borno State. It's a pleasure also to have you um, join us on the program via Zoom. Thank you, uh, Matthias. You're welcome. So kickstart the conversation for us, Musa. What's the mood like? Um, in Meduguri and other parts of the state, I mean, after what happened uh, over the weekend? Um, uh, honestly speaking, we are grieving and uh, things are not going well in Meduguri. Wherever you see people, the topic of discussion have been uh, the inhuman acts uh, actually carried out by these people who are claiming it uh, to be doing it based on religion. So um, people were actually looking at how the governor how his face and his reactions and what he actually said at NTA uh, that people cannot stay and die for hunger and they cannot also go out so that they will be killed. So people are actually seeing this thing as um, something that something that needs uh, immediate action here in my degree. Uh, all right. So, uh, I mean, while we're looking at the trends, uh, one of the uh, tweets uh, that we actually saw was people saying that um, there needs to be some form of cooperation between residents of the state and the Nigerian army. Um, perhaps if that was there, according to that tweet, uh, this may not have happened. Is there any sour relationship between residents and the army? Well, um, actually, I can't say that there is no uh, synergy. However, we can actually seek for more cooperation because if we look at what happened uh, the day yesterday or the day before yesterday is that um, it's more of a retaliatory attack. On Wednesday, that's two days ago, 
um, there was some sort of attack to the basis of uh, the insurgency around Koshebe. Koshebe is actually not a town. It's more of a small village that farmers used to farm. There is a forest reserve that is demarcated by government by the other side with a pound where the villagers used to catch fish and then farm rice by the other side. So it's more of a bush, but there is a constant patrol by security. So if we look at the Saturday, there is actually an ongoing election. So there is a possibility of maybe um, those insurgents taking advantage to uh, attack the farmers because they feel like the security may not be as it used to be. And they actually accuse the farmers of being the ones who shot or leaked intelligence to security about their hideout. So they attacked them since uh, on Wednesday they were attacked. About two people were killed. That's two Boko Haram members were killed. One is missing. One motorcycle was recovered. One AK-47 gun was also recovered by security. That is two days before 43 people were slaughtered. So based on the narrative of the people who survived the attack, that they actually attacked them and did that to them for giving cooperation uh, for the security personnel. So you can see these kind of incidents can further actually worsen the relationship between um, people who are resident in those kind of communities and the security, since these are the kinds of consequences that will follow if these kinds of things happen. So there is a need for immediate action, actually. All right, I'll come back to you in just a bit, uh, but let me head over to our Abuja studio, uh, where Kabir Baba is joining us from. Well, Kabir, uh, talking about the synergy between the residents of the state and the uh, security forces, uh, like he just said now, um, if that should happen, uh, he's even saying that this was perhaps a consequence of um, the residents telling the army, you know, or given the hideouts uh, of the insurgents to the army. Um, so moving forward, what can be done? How can there be this form of collaboration between the army and the residents and not, uh, which will not result in such uh, killings at the end of the day? Kabir. Uh, insurgents, right from when they started, they have a method of once you bring out information and you give to the security, they find a way to come back to that local government and kill people in that local government. So people started getting afraid of giving information to the military. And even within the military, there have been times that there have been saboteurs within the military. So sometimes information that you give out to the military, they come back to haunt you. So people just found a way that, okay, since this is the situation we have, they better keep quiet. And then if you even look at this particular instance, the, rest, the farmers there, they just got courage, caught one of the member of the Boko Haram and handed him over to the security personnel. But then they, when they came back on Saturday, the situation was they were deceived because for you to imagine how they can get more than 40 something people to a hut, tie you and start slaughtering you. First of all, they were deceived that government were going to give them some and things they need for their farm. So most of them gathered there in anticipation of collecting those things, not knowing it was a trap that was set for them. So what we will expect from the government is that the way they fight this insurgency, when it started, it, was, oh, it is new to the Nigerian army, so they don't really know. It's not a conventional war. But now you have technologies. You have drones. Nigerian Air Force, some last month claimed that they bought a drone that could fly over the air and hang there for 36 hours. So if you have such things and the residents of that community have reported to you that they've seen movements of some suspected Boko Haram members, the best thing for Nigerian army to do is to send a drone to fly and do some recognizance around that area and truly see, yes, this information these people are giving us, is it true or not? So they need to really work together to find a solution to this uh, unhealthy situation we are facing now. 
Uh, all right, so the, the, the governor of Borno made some recommendations to the delegation that uh, visited uh, Borno State today, led by the Senate president. And, you know, he talked about uh, recruitment of youths into the military uh, to boost the military strength, uh, you know, engaging the services of neighboring Niger, Chad, and Cameroon to clear the remnants of the insurgents in Lake Chad and the Mandara Mountains. Uh, he also talked about providing uh, mine resistance, armored personnel carriers, and other equipment uh, for the military, the police, and of course, other paramilitary agencies. Uh, he's also talking about engaging mercenaries to support the repatriation of IDPs in Cameroon and Niger and increase livelihood support for the people of Borno State. Um, some of these recommendations now, especially the ones that uh, he's talking about uh, employing youths from that region or those that are already in the civilian JTF and also hunting into the Nigerian army and the civil defense. Do you think this will be a good uh, way? Do you think this will be a step in the right direction to curb this menace? Yes, we using those civilian JTF, if you will ask the army, it's one of the best things that happened in the fight against this insurgency. Because most of these members of the civilian JTF we have are youths in the society, that community. So most of them, they know each other. They know a family, they can tell that this family have members, that their children are members of Boko Haram. No, this family do not have. They know strangers. But you have a Nigerian army whereby you have people from different parts of the country brought together to serve in the Nigerian army. Now, for example, if you bring somebody from Anambra State and there is a conflict in Bonu State, once he goes there, he don't really know the environment, he don't know the people. But when you work with this civilian JTF, those are people that are indigenous of that region. So they are very aware of people that are strangers, people that are missing, people that are members of this Boko Haram. So it's very easy for them to help the Nigerian army, giving them information about who these people are, where these people are. Then if you look at using these hunters, we all know hunters are people that are brave. They can go into places that normal people may likely not want to go, but they do that. And these Boko Haram people, because of the attacks they get, they usually settle in the bushes, forests. So if you have hunters that are able to get into those places, it will be difficult for them to keep hiding. And then... If you're even looking at the unrest in the Northeast, the youth really need to get employed. Because when you look at youth unemployment, you are just at home, you are doing nothing. Somebody comes to meet you. If you can do this for us, we will give you this. They say, wow, this is an easier way of making money. But not knowing you are destroying the economy, you are destroying the lives of people, you are destroying the country. So it's very unfortunate that this is allowed to go on for this while. Those youth really need to be involved. The government really needs to bring them out. Because youth, when you are jobless, it's an idle, you're an idle man. That's the devil's workshop. The ideology that these people bring to them is that we have a situation whereby you will make it to heaven. You will be rewarded at the end of the day. But then they deceive you. Let me digress a little. You come and bring part of the Quran that tells you to kill people and you make it to heaven. But even in the Quran, it has been condemned. You do not kill a soul except there is a legal just to that. And this legal just we are talking about is a court of law that will find somebody guilty and sentence that person to death. But you will just deceive and brainwash them and give them this ideology that if you do this, you are going to heaven. So it's a very wrong ideology that those people put into these youths. We really need to bring the youths to be more enlightened, to be more enlightened about all the ongoings. Uh, all right, Kabira, let me just hold you there for a bit. Um, we'll take a quick break, and of course, we'll come back and continue. Please stay with us. Well, thank you for staying with us. We we'll still have with us our panelists in our Buja studio as well as via Zoom um, joining us from Borno State. We're looking at the insecurity issues 
bedeviling the country at the moment. So, Musa, let me just uh, come back to you. Uh, again, you're joining us um, from uh, Meduguri in Borno State. Um, one of the issues that has arisen over the weekend is the conflicting figures that uh, we've been getting you know, as to the number of those who were victims of that incident. Um, what exactly, have you heard any, anything, is there, is there any new figure? Because the Nigerian army is holding its stand saying it's just 43 people. Meanwhile, the, um, the UN is saying that it's over 100 people. What exactly is the right number? Have you heard anything else? Well, um, to be frank, actually, I would like to uh, say what he said that about 43 people were killed in one place. Um, that is uh, not uh, exactly correct per se, because um, Boko Haram have been using these tactics for a long while now. Like two to three months ago, some farmers were killed, were slaughtered just outside of Meduguri in Dalori. So Boko Haram new tactics of killing people now is they don't shoot guns. They capture farmers with bare hands and kill them so that if they use guns, other people who are walking around the vicinity will hear the sounds around away. And the condition has become even worse that farmers do not even go to farm in some part of our villages until they have security guard. They now go to farm, they go to bush with escort. They go and work in the morning, then they converge at appointed time, where the vigilantes will just blow whistle for everybody to converge, then they escort them back to their towns. This was the situation even before the Saturday's attack. So it's a manifestation of something that has been given it indicators before it happened. And then regarding the figures, 43 people that were, have been the victims, actually, only 25 have been found slaughtered in one place. And only 34 bodies were recovered as of Saturday, uh, as of the Sunday morning that they were buried. Only 34 bodies were buried, while nine bodies are still in the bush. So some were actually captured on their way, trying to escape and just slaughtered in the place. So they were not gathered in one place and just like um, slaughtered as the story goes. So what we have on ground is that, as you said, military said is 43, 434 have been buried. Um, nine are still in the bush, not found yet as of as we speak. Though this morning there are possibility, and from what we heard that um, the civilian JTF special force are actually already in the forest in search of the these people who have done this heinous crime and as well as recover the bodies. Among the 43 people, according to Amnesty International, 10 people are IDPs who are, who are actually living in Palm Center, just outside um, the city of Maiduguri, and 10 women who are working in a farm close to Koshebe, where this incident happened, are nowhere to be found. Though their bodies have not been recovered, they are either being kidnapped or something happened, they are still nowhere to be found. So as we speak, the official figure remains 43 <laughs> people, and nine bodies are still uh, not yet actually found. So this is actually what we have on ground so far. Yeah, all right. So the, the, let me uh, bring you again the issue of um, uh, unemployment, uh, like Kabir made mention. Uh, do you think if uh, some of the youths uh, that are part of the, C, uh, the civilian JTF and also hunters are also um, employed into the uh, military, do you think this will also uh, be a good solution to the problem? When he said um, these hunters and civilian JTF are brave, I want to uh, narrate that this is not only an issue of bravery, it's an issue of you knowing the bush. These are people who know the forest. These are people who know the bush. Even before Boko Haram came, these guys are hunting in the forest. They know the exact ways where somebody can hide. So the issue of unemployment is a serious issue that needs to be addressed. Yes, agreed that um, unemployment is seriously part of the issue. And then there is a need for alternative narrative. Most of these people feel that they are doing this thing because of religion. No religion allow killing of people. La ikra afidin. There is no compulsion in religion. But there is a need for our religious leaders to come out frankly without fears and speak to the world that this is not religion. There is a need for alternative narrative. There is a need to address the increasing number of unemployment among youth. A devil's mind, mind is a... Uh, an idle man's mind is a double workshop, as he said. That is very true. There is a need for employment. This, coupled with the issue of uh, COVID-19, that many people have lost their jobs, and the country is already in recession, there is a need for people to be engaged. And All these right. guys have already been engaged into the civilian JTM task force. They should be incorporated into the security forces. I agree with that.
All right, Musa Gambo, I'd have to say thank you for joining us uh, on the program and sharing your thoughts. Keep staying, staying safe, and hopefully this will come to an end sooner rather than later. Again, thanks for joining us via Zoom from Meduguri in Borno State. Thank you so much, Azim. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. Well, Kabir, as we wind down this conversation, uh, what, would you, what would be your recommendation uh, moving forward uh, to nip this uh, situation in the bud? All right. First of all, if you look at the service chiefs that we are having, people are looking at these service chiefs that they have overstayed their term. And we expect President Muhammad Buhari to let those service chiefs go, bring in new sets of service chiefs that will bring in new ideas and new morale to this military. If you look at the chief of army staff, he's from the north, Medjugorje. The chief of uh, air staff, he's from the north. The minister of defense, the national security advisor, they are all northerners. And this thing is happening right in your region. So many people are not even happy with President Mohamed Buhari anymore. You need to change these service chiefs to bring people with new ideas, to change the whole operation of the Nigerian army. You cannot be doing the same thing over and over, and you keep expecting to get a different result. It's very wrong for them to keep working that way. So we need the government to really step up to their responsibility. The protection right. of every citizen of a, a country is saddled on the president, the governors, the chief of securities. They are all, right. all supposed to protect our lives. If somebody cannot That's... comfortably go to his farm and farm and come back home, it's just, it's just a shame. It's a shame, really. And it's sad for we to find ourselves in this situation in this country. Um, so the president uh, needs to live up to his responsibility as the commander-in-chief of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. All right, Kabir, let's uh, hope that happens again sooner rather than later, and hopefully that would be the solution uh, that we all have been looking for, and that hopefully we again will nip uh, the, the situation we have right now in the bud. But I have to say thank you for joining us, Kabir Raba, security analyst from our Buja studio. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks again. Well, that's uh, where we are, but as always, our YouTube channel has always been keeping you abreast. It is an alternative for you when you miss the news, when you miss stories, you can go there and watch um, those videos that you missed. So let's take a look at those videos that you watched the most in the past week. This week's top five videos kick off with a visit of the Southeast governors to Governor Yesom Wike over the violence that took place in Uyigo River State. I have traveled everywhere in the north. There's nowhere I went to the north where you cannot find Igbo people. What does it mean of deployment of answers? It's followed by the army representative answering questions during the panel of inquiry on alleged Ensign's brutality against Nigerians. Observation monitoring, training, and readiness for deployment. Third spot is taken by an episode of Channel TV's hard copy that featured rapper Jude M.I. Abaga, an actor and politician Gate Hensher. An entertainment industry that has the heritage of standing and speaking for the people. You know, I mean, we are from the ilk of Femi Kuti, I mean, Fela Kuti, you know, and, and a generation that always spoke through their music, through their art, you know, the RMDs, the Kate Henshaws. And so the younger generation have learned that when the opportunity comes, you stand and you speak for the people. In second place is Senator Ayinaya Abaribe arguing that the Buhari led federal government has failed Nigerians. What do we have today? That's what we're asking. And until this government can come to grips with what they promised, that the only thing you can do is to say, it has failed. While the first spot is taken by the video of a tanker explosion on a Tedola bridge in Lagos, which occurred in 2018.
Well, there you go. Those were the most viewed videos on our YouTube channel in the past week. And that's where we wrap it up on the program today. Thank you for watching. I'm Victor Mathias.